Hi, Drew and Jonathan Scott here, reminding you that a lot of life's firsts are better with help from American Family Insurance. Like your first home expansion or your first big lightning strike. There's a first for everything. Get the right home policy at the right price with the right help from American Families agents. Life's better when you're under American Families' roof. Insure carefully, dream fearlessly. Get a quote and find an agent at AmFam.com. Products not available in every state. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, S.I. and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 214. I'm your host, Chris Webster, with my co-host, Paul Zimmerman. Today, we talk to Dr. Matthew Harpster about his new book, Reconstructing a Maritime Past. Let's get to it. Welcome to the show, everyone. Paul, how you doing? I'm doing all right. It's been pretty quiet around here, but yesterday I was down in the city. Uh, I'm sure you know, I've told you, my wife is a curator at the Department of Ancient New East and Art in the Bent Museum, and mm-hmm. they had an event for uh, Yemeni community. It included the Yemeni ambassador to the U.S., the U.S. Wow. special envoy to Yemen, mem- some other scholars, m- members of the, of the community, dancers, coffee, all sorts of stuff about the repatriation of a couple artifacts that, uh, that were in the collection that were wow. found to have been brought out of Yemen some time ago under questionable circumstances. So mm-hmm. those are being repatriated and there was a celebration around that. And this is one event that hopefully precedes many similar ones where, well, not necessarily with the repatriation, but definitely <laughs> with the involvement of the local, in this case, Yemeni diaspora community in New York. Cool. Well, that sounds like a like a good time. Sounds like an interesting event. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was really, it was a lot of fun and it was great to see all these different sort of pan-Yemeni things because I've lived in different parts of Yemen and worked in different mm-hmm. parts and it's very culturally distinct depending where you go, but there is also this overarching sense of Yemeniness, whether you're from the <laughs> highlands or from Hadramaut or the Dihama or anywhere. And that was celebrated. Nice. You know, we're planning on spending the summer in New England. And I'm really hoping to get, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't want to say to New York City because, you know, I don't want to spend too much time there because, you know, it's New York City and I have an RV. But it would be nice to visit again because, man, every time you go, like we went to the Met the last time we were there. And every time you go, I'm sure there's just something new to see. Right. And it would be oh, really yeah. cool to visit there again. So, all right. Well, speaking of revisiting things, We have a person on the show today who we talked to originally in April of 2020, so straight up COVID times, and again, we're recording this in April of 2024, so four years ago, and his name is Dr. Matthew Harpster, and he talked to us about a technique that was being developed that he's going to talk about here in the first segment, and then he's recently written a book using this technique and discussing basically how it was applied and and what's going on there. So we're going to talk about that. Matthew Harpster received his PhD at Texas A&M University in 2006 and has since held research and teaching posts at MIT, Eastern Mediterranean University, the University of Birmingham, and I'll get this wrong, Koch University. It's K-O-C and C's got that little thing that they put over in Turkey underneath the sea. (laughs) Anyway, the university in Istanbul, Turkey, which is where he's calling in from today. He has been the director of KUDAR, which is the, again, I don't know how to pronounce this word, Koch or Koch University's Maritime Archaeology Research Center since 2017. So Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. So, you know, just in case our listeners are new to the show and don't exactly remember everything you discussed four years ago, (laughs) because that was a lot of episodes ago, almost 100 episodes ago for us, which is kind of cool and frightening in its own right. So why don't you tell us just a little bit about this model that you developed for this maritime activity thing in in the Mediterranean Sea? Just tell us a little bit about that as a framework for the rest of the discussion. Well, I suppose the model that I created, and this was done with Henry Chapman, who is a professor of archaeology at the University of Birmingham. We worked on this model in which we wanted to find a way in which we could illustrate the activity of ancient maritime activity that was rather different than the way we commonly saw it in a lot of scholarship, as I think the two of you have often seen. We Mm -hmm. often see models of maritime activity that are done with vectors or lines. And so we see a route going from point A to point B. But Mm -hmm. I I feel that anyone who's been on board a ship, anyone who's tried sailing, knows that there's a whole lot of ambiguity about about the route you take even before Mm -hmm. you arrive at your destination. 
And right. so what Henry and I were working on is if there's another way to visualize and illustrate that activity. And then simultaneously, if there's a way that we could really harness the potential of the maritime archaeological corpus that's present in the Mediterranean Sea. And we, we were interested in that as well, because from our perspective, we have, depending upon which data set you look at, we have anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 archaeological sites on the floor of the Mediterranean Sea. So there must be a way to no. harness all that material, all that information from all these different centuries and come up with a different way of illustrating this maritime movement. And that's really where it started. Yeah, that's got to be incredibly difficult, too, because I would imagine, you know, most sailors, you know, and, and I have, you know, I've been on quite a few boats in my time and the, the route you choose to take is generally, you know, the shortest route between point A and point B, unless you're doing some sightseeing, which I can't imagine people doing shipping and things like that with cargo. We're doing a whole lot of sightseeing because their livelihood is based on, you know, picking up cargo and selling it somewhere else or, or dropping it off and getting payment for it. But then also, you know, the Mediterranean is also a pretty volatile place when it wants to be. <laughs> I spent a whole <laughs> spent a whole six months there on a on an aircraft carrier, U.S. aircraft carrier, and I'll tell you what. Sometimes that sea really just got rocket and rolling, which is probably why there's over a thousand shipwrecks there. And I mean, how accurate do you think you guys have gotten over the development of this model in deciding, you know? these shipping routes and, and, and where they're going and, and what's your confidence level in that based on the shipwrecks? Well, I suppose there's a, a couple of things to consider. One thing to consider is that we're not necessarily, or at least with this technique we're using, we're not necessarily coming up with particular routes that mm -hmm. you feel people were following. What we feel that we're modeling is actually areas or varying densities uh -huh. of maritime activity. So, Got for it. example, we might see as a result of looking at shipwreck data from the first century BC that there's a hot spot of maritime activity right off the west coast of Italy. Now, when you're asking about how we can confirm this or how we might feel that this is relatively accurate, we've got a couple of methods. One method is that we can predictably just compare this to what was happening historically. So when we look at our model and we find that in the second century BC and in the first century BC, there's this hot spot of maritime activity right off the western coast of Italy, right around the region of Latium. You know, that's the same period of time that Rome was really increasing in its power, you know, stretching its legs from a republic, slowly becoming an empire. Mm. So, you know, historically it fits with things like that. But we also wanted to find a way in which we could more quantitatively test the accuracy of what we're doing, because you guys are archaeologists. You know that the material set of information that we have can be really haphazard. It can be mm -hmm. really broken up by all kinds of different forces, both in the past and the present. And so Henry and I were very aware of the fact that we're making models of activity from these rather haphazard sets of data. And so we wanted to find some way to more I don't know, analytically determine if the models that we're making are distinctly different from haphazard random data, or if it's very similar to randomized data. And so in addition to making the models, we will also sample the density of the models in certain places, and then use statistical significance testing to compare the archaeological density against the density from a model generated by randomized data. Mm. And if the p-value, that, that magical p-value, mm -hmm. uh, tells us that there's a high level of confidence in the archaeological model, then we can trust it. However, in some cases, that doesn't always work, which is a question I'm still wrestling with today, in fact. Well, can we just back up a little bit here before we go too far into the weeds? Because the, the interesting thing, and you gave us uh, access to an advanced copy of, of your upcoming book, Reconstructing a Maritime Past, which builds off of this model and then goes way beyond it with what you can try to say about how we look at cultures and movement of people and ships and so on across the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. But before we go down that <laughs> rabbit hole, <laughs> can you just back up a little bit and briefly recap? what the GIS techniques are that you're using for building these densities, these heat maps mm -hmm. that then you're testing statistically. 
Yeah. So, you know, as I said earlier, we're not really coming up with roots as much as areas of activity. Mm -hmm. And so to come up with like the hotspots of where activity may be at sea, we're simply piling up all this data from, say, all the shipwreck sites from the first century BC or the third century AD. But because we're trying to understand areas of activity as opposed to particular routes, it means that when we look at an individual site, we're also trying to come up with the area that this particular ship may have been moving around before it sank. Mm -hmm. So with the single site, we're using as much archaeological information we have within that particular assemblage. And it could be amphorae coming from Campania, it could be oil lamps, it could be personal items, it could be cargo, it could be all kinds of things. But then all of those different sources of material gives us a rough estimate of where this ship may have been moving around before it sank. And mm -hmm. predictably, there are a host of potential problems in there. People often ask, well, what about things that may not be preserved? What about items that could have been on board the ship but are no longer there? And as a result, we're only getting an incomplete mm -hmm. record of what we see. And those are all very valid criticisms. But we're in a position in which we can recognize those, but we don't really have a way of overcoming them because it's the very same set of data that everyone else is using and we're all stuck with these same limitations. But what we're able to do with all the magic tools in GIS is that once we have the approximate area that one ship may have been moving around, we can then simply repeat that process for all of the archaeological assemblages within our data set. And I have about 1,100 of those assemblages. So in mm. the end, I have this map of the Mediterranean with, you know, 1,100, you could say polygons all piled up. Mm. But once I have all those polygons, I can then use the GIS modeling and all of its fancy tools to actually measure the different densities of those polygons at different points in georeference space. So off the coast of Italy, the example I was talking about earlier, we might find that there's a high density of those polygons off that west coast. In other places near the Straits of Gibraltar or off the coast of Algeria, there could be a very low density of polygons. And the assumption I'm making is that if a single polygon roughly represents the area that this ship may have been operating in, then when we have the, all these polygons piling up, this density of them, it suggests to me that this is an area with a higher likelihood of activity, that this is an area with a higher potential of movement as opposed to other spaces at the sea. All right. I've got some questions around that, as I'm sure Paul okay. does as well. But let's go ahead and take a break and come back and continue this discussion on the other side. Back in a minute. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. <laughs> 
When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth Shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make Shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Welcome back to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 214. We're talking with Matthew Harpster. Take a look at some of the links in the show notes, especially for his last episode, which is really foundational to what we're talking about here back in April of 2020, episode 126. So you were talking about at the end of the last segment how these polygons are showing areas where you know, there's a, a level of activity, basically, right, that ships were operating in. What is it that you're trying to, because I'm maybe you're saying this and I'm just not getting it, but what are you trying to predict with this model? Because that's often why we have models, right? We say, here's what's here. We need to try to predict with this model and see if it will, you know, come up with something. So what what exactly are you trying to predict with this? Well, I wouldn't quite say that I'm at a prediction stage yet, but I think okay. getting, in okay. a way, as a result of these models and, you know, I end up with these wonderful gradient maps across the Mediterranean <laughs> that look like. Mm -hmm. They look like weather maps, actually, predicting where there's going to be more <laughs> right. or less, really. But as a result of those maps, it allows me to argue, as I said, that, you know, there's more activity here and less activity there. So I'm not necessarily predicting anything yet. But what I am finding is that once I've generated these maps, it allows me to do a couple of things. One is that I can compare this model of maritime activity to other sets of data. So I can compare it mm. to terrestrial sets of archaeological data. I can compare mm. it to textual sources that also talk about people sailing and moving around the Mediterranean. And so I think that those comparisons are interesting, but I think they also reinforce in a way the second goal of these models is that they suggest that this maritime community across the Mediterranean Sea they have a life that isn't, or rather it is fairly independent that what might be happening on land, that they have a life, they have a history, they have a narrative. This is a muted and a marginalized community. And I think what these models start to do, or they suggest we can do, is that we can start to understand this muted maritime community with a bit more detail than what we might have had in the past. Hmm. Okay. This didn't come to me till just as you said that right now, but it, it does kind of remind me of studies of nomadic cultures or semi-nomadic ones. And, you know, I do most of my work in the Middle East uh -huh. and very famously there are nomadic cultures like the Bedouin. Is that a fair comparison? You know, ones that aren't directly, you know, they're not in Rome, but they certainly interact with Rome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that a good comparison for the, uh, the maritime community that you're thinking of? I think it would be a good comparison. In fact, I'd, I'd love to talk with you afterwards to get any information you have about the material records coming out of those nomadic communities. Because, I mean, I agree a great deal. It's very similar to these nomadic groups, because in the particular cases I'm looking at, rather than moving through these very arid environments, they're moving through the maritime environment. And unlike perhaps walking through the desert, you know, these individuals might have a particular route that they follow, but there could be reasons that they're not following it. There could be reasons that they're going in other directions. And so we are very much trying to model the activities of this very mobile, migratory, marginalized group of people that, unfortunately, don't really have a voice in the primary records that we can look at. And if I was reading your book correctly, um, you're looking at the, uh, the material record to try to get closer to the bone, as it were, to closer to the people who are actually involved in that trade versus most of the previous studies that, that tend to start with a, uh, a textual or a very cultural historical sense of what the ship is and who might be on it. And here you're trying to invert that, I guess, use those sources as secondary tests, I guess, against uh, what you're finding based off of the material record and your mapping of it. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it, you know, because as we know, there's obviously an ideological, a personal, there can be all kinds of biases within mm -hmm. these textual records. 
And often these records were made by people who were literate. They're in the upper classes. These are people who are probably not sailing on these boats every day. So when we're reading these textual sources to learn more about what sailing was like in the Mediterranean, I think we're looking at it from this very particular and a very narrow perspective. And so when we can use this archaeological data, I'm not suggesting that this archaeological model and the narrative that comes out of it replaces what we have in the textual sources, but I think it creates a very nice comparison. So if the textual sources are telling us one thing and the archaeological data is telling us something else, then when we have that discrepancy, what does it mean? What is it telling us? And alternatively, when they fit together, what is that also telling us? So I have some examples in which we can look at various textual sources like Strabo, Pliny, other individuals, and they provide us with a rough cartography of the Mediterranean Sea. So they talk mm -hmm. about the Tyrrhenian Sea, the Aegean, all of these different sort of places out there in the water. And so what happens when I compare my models that have these gradient heat maps against these rough cartographies of the sea? You know, what happens? Do I find that the places that appear to have a high amount of activity, do they correlate with these cartographies known by, by Strabo and Pliny, for example, or do they not correlate? In some cases they do, which is an interesting question, and in other cases they don't. Which do you think came first? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Are they that named because there's a lot of activity yeah. there? Or, <laughs> or is there a lot of activity there because there are places that's worthy of being named? Yeah. I mean, it, it, but I mean, th that's a great question. And I think that's the sort of question we can start asking now because we mm. have these two separate narratives about what's happening at sea. Yeah. I mean, there's various saints when they were, say, taking a pilgrimage to the <laughs> Holy Land. But there's a particular saint who was traveling from he was traveling from Tunisia to the Holy Land, and he talks about all the different seas that he travels through. And mm. what's interesting is that at the time he traveled in the fifth century AD, you know, he has a whole lot of detail about the waters just offshore of where he lived. And at the same time in my models, there's a whole lot of maritime activity there. So there appears mm. to be this very nice, how can I say? synchronicity between these two separate data sets, where we have an individual with all this detailed information about what the waters were called, we also have a lot of maritime activity. But it doesn't always work that well. So you know, listening to you talk about this, these patterns of maritime activity, Matthew, I was wondering, well, first off, what kind of a date range are we talking about here with the the archaeological sites that are in your in your samples here, you know, you said there's over a thousand shipwrecks there. What kind of a span does this have, first off? Well, my data set runs from about the 7th century BC until the 7th okay. century AD. Yeah. And Matthew, what's a, what's the reason for, for that particular time span, 7th century to 7th century? I mean, in a, in a very weird way, I kind of like the symmetry of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, nice. for, for that, seriously. I mean, for another reason is that if you look at a number of studies that plot the number of shipwreck sites or the number of archaeological sites on the seafloor, they not only roughly use that chronology, but they also mm. demonstrate that there's, a, that there's a rough bell curve to the number of sites we have. And the, the apex of that curve is generally either right at zero or it's like the first or second century AD. So it it also parallels a lot of other studies like that. Gotcha. Okay. Well, one thing I was wondering is sea level change, right? Mm -hmm. The Mediterranean Sea, like the rest of the world, has has adjusted. I was just briefly looking this up because I knew this was true, but I was trying to find some numbers here. And there's been, in some places, up to several meters of sea level change since, you know, like high point of Roman times up until now. So mm -hmm. over the 7th century BC to AD, I would imagine there was some definite variation there. Do you see changes in shipping patterns based on that? Because, I mean, just sailing around the Greek islands like we did back in October, I mean, I can get real hazardous real quick <laughs> if it's a little bit lower, you know? That's a good question. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any dramatic differences. However, mm -hmm. having said that, I didn't actually specifically look at it. So I don't mm. know 
I don't know how much the Aegean Islands, the their silhouettes will have changed. I mean, some of them naturally sure. got bigger, but yeah. I don't. But I don't think that any of them actually. How can how can we put it? Like they merged from like two islands into one because there was that much change in the sea level. Uh, yeah. But I don't honestly okay. know. That's a good question. I can try yeah. that. I've got another, I guess, epistemological question for you here. Yeah. Where well, you're talking about the Tunisian saint, it sounds to me like he was basically uh, following the coastline rather than sailing out in the open sea, which I guess makes sense if he's just going to the Holy Land from Tunisia. Mm. Do you have recognizable in your maps or in the data that that your maps are built off of recognizable differences between the the larger ships, presumably that would be crossing the Mediterranean, and the ones that would be doing more local routes, you know, along the coastlines. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a there's a couple elements to that question that make it. It's a very good question, and there's a couple elements to consider. One is that how can I say? Sometimes we don't necessarily know the size of the ship that we're looking at when we're looking at the material on the seafloor. Because, mm -hmm. for example, a very large ship could sink, but yet we don't necessarily have all of it on the seafloor. That right. isn't to say that, that we don't have any large ships. There's some very good mm -hmm. examples from the first centuries BC and AD of vessels that probably carried anywhere from seven to 10,000 amphora. So we have a few examples of those in the Western Mediterranean. So within my data set, that's a good question. That's something I can investigate is do I find more large vessels sailing out of sight of land as opposed to ones close to land? But also keep in mind that, and this is something related to the history of the discipline, that until, say, the past 15, 20 years, most of the investigations of archaeological sites underwater have been done close to the coastline, simply because mm. we didn't have the technology to go into deeper water. Right. Mm. So maybe a follow-up to that then, would the uh, size of the polygon that you're yeah. doing, uh, would that possibly be a proxy for the kind of ship that's being used? Mm, I, I don't think so. And also keep in mind that we have those big ships that are, say, in the late Roman Republic, the early Roman Imperial period. Beyond that uh, high point there within the set of data we have, most of the vessels that we find, when they're well preserved and we can estimate how big they are, most of the vessels we have tend to be anywhere from 10 to about 15 meters long. So mm -hmm. th that's even, say, during the Hellenistic period, the Greek period, late antiquity, Byzantine era. Mm -hmm. So there's not a whole lot of variety there in terms of size. So okay. having said that, the size of the polygon is actually related to where the material in the archaeological site comes from. So mm -hmm. we could have mm -hmm. a ship that sank off the coast of Carthage, for example, but there could be material within the site that comes from Terra Canensis in Spain, comes from Marseille in southern France, and comes from Ostia or Rome. So that would make a very large polygon, but the ship itself might only be 10, 14 meters long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that hints at other patterns of how the uh, the materials are being traded. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, that sounds like a good place to take our final break. We'll do that and come back on the other side and wrap up this discussion back in a minute. Welcome back to Archaeotech 214, final segment. And I was wondering, we're talking about the data set and the shipwrecks, and you mentioning the polygons are basically created based on what's at the archaeological site, which makes sense because that, you know, the contents of a shipwreck should somewhat determine where they've been because, you know, they didn't have eBay back then and Amazon, so they can't just order stuff. They got to go get it, right? <laughs> and so that would make a lot of sense. I'm wondering, does your data set filter out like warships and things like that, even though they probably did have to get supplies in other places and might have things from other areas within their ship? But does it filter out warships and you're just talking about trade and, and merchant vessels? Yeah, that's another good question that has a whole bunch of parts to mm. it. Within my data set, I'm simply using as much as I can from a variety of sources. So I okay. individually am not trying to filter out, this is a warship, this is a merchant ship. Hmm. But related to that, there are two other things to consider. One is that merchant ships could have a military role. So there's yeah. a 
hypothesis that there was a Byzantine era ship that sank off the south coast of Turkey at a place called Yasada. And there's a hypothesis that this merchant vessel was actually bringing supplies for the Byzantine army at the time. Mm -hmm. They were fighting against the Persians. So, you know, if we start trying to distinguish between military vessels and cargo vessels, we run into that awkward issue. But another thing to consider is that, yes, military vessels and say we're thinking of a very, you know, stereotypical one like a trireme or some other Mm -hmm. board ship with everybody on board. They would still need supplies. They would need, you know, whatever for food and water. However, those ships are attacked or they're damaged, they don't necessarily sink because in some Hmm. cases captured or in other Uh. cases, the reason a lot of our maritime archaeological data set is filled with what we classify as merchant vessels is because all of that heavy stuff in the ship helps it to sink. So a trireme just has a bunch of people on board and they'll swim away if they can. And then the ship itself is either captured or it just floats and falls apart. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that is really having me thinking of a lot of different things here. But let me try to bring a little bit of coherence to my thoughts is that I do like your argument of, of looking at these these ships based off of the you know their contents rather than uh, I guess how it would normally be presented, right? We find out about a new shipwreck and we see the news and it'll say, oh, you know, Greek shipwreck found off the coast of wherever, mm-hmm. you know, and Roman shipwreck or whatever. But it always starts with the culture. And that may not be particularly reflective of the materials that are on it, but it also doesn't necessarily mean who's on it. Mm-hmm. And I think of, I probably brought this up last time we talked, but the shipwreck that I know best is the Uluburun shipwreck. So this yeah. is, um, you know, late Bronze Age, but it's uh, it's taken as being emblematic of um, of the international period at the time because it's got materials from all over the Eastern Mediterranean that mm-hmm. went down in, on the same place. The other thing that I know about are the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea, uh, yeah. which is supposed to be written by an anonymous Greek sailor, but you know he talks about the different ports of call and the materials you can get. And I think that, you know, th- if his ship were to have gone down, it would have been filled with stuff that was, you know, from the Mediterranean world, as well as the Red Sea, as well as all the way out to India. Yeah. And I think about like how many vessels are registered in Liberia <laughs> you know, or any story that has sailors. It's, you know, these people are from this city and these people are from that country. And it's, it's a mishmash of, of a variety of different people. So, so I, I just, uh, it, it tickles me, actually. I guess I can't think of any better way to put it, but it tickles me to think about, about not starting from the point of the culture, mm-hmm. but letting that maybe develop out of the materials that are on it and with the possibility too that there is this broader kind of maritime culture that can be interrogated Mm -hmm. yeah and that's i mean i would love to say i can take credit for that but i certainly cannot i mean a (laughs) a variety of scholars prior to me you know even in like the 1970s and 80s they were talking about maritime cultures and you can even find people doing north american archaeology that talk about maritime cultures in the 1920s and the 1930s when they're looking at indigenous communities on the coastlines of the Pacific. But, I mean, what you said is, I think, appropriate because I I like this idea of this maritime culture because it does step away from a lot of the disciplinary baggage that can be associated with saying the ship is Greek, the ship is Roman, the ship is Byzantine. Because from my perspective, You know, we're applying those labels because that's how we tend to look at ships today. You know, everyone has a ship registered somewhere, or at least I don't, but most people do. And so (laughs) having having those national labels, it's very much a modern thing. And you can even see examples of this in UNESCO uh, legislation. They they talk about finding the, uh, how can I put it, the country of origin for a particular Mm. ship. And there's just so many problems associated with that. So Mm -hmm. saying that we have this maritime community and the Mediterranean Sea is the landscape or the maritime cultural landscape that they operate in, I think it it gives us all these different options, all these new ways of thinking about the archaeological data set. And speaking of the archaeological data set, do you think that this kind of a technique of polygons and 
heat maps built from those would be applicable to other kinds of archaeological data sets, not just shipwrecks? I think it would be. I mean, you two were asking about nomadic communities previously. I mean, that mm-hmm. it would be very interesting to look at, say, the material record left by a nomadic group somewhere as they're traveling somewhere. And then what if we tried to apply the same method there? You know, would we find or would we create some sort of polygon or an area that roughly indicates where this group was likely moving around? I, I don't know. I'd love to test that. And so it could be further applicable to that kind of group. It could be further applicable in other seas around the world as well, because that's something that I think would be very interesting to do in the future, because if this method relies only upon the archaeological data set, then it means that we don't need all the textual records to come up with that narrative. What we need is a nice size or a, a good sized archaeological record to work with. Hmm. Have you uh, thrown AI at this like everybody else has? See what oh, it says. I tried. <laughs> I really tried. And I don't know if the people I contacted were just like throwing their hands up in frustration and thought, I'm not going to do this at all. Or they just looked at it and said, I don't know, I'm convinced that there's some like AI engineers who are so focused on, I don't know, doing the latest research that they don't have the time to apply it to social sciences yet. So, right. But yeah, I'm, I haven't thrown AI at it. I haven't had the chance, but I've been very lucky to talk with a guy here on campus who does computer engineering and computer sciences. And Hmm. hopefully the next coming year, we're going to be applying a lot of new statistical modeling and analytical techniques to the data set to really kind of pull out more subtlety or more answers about why some of the models seem to work, why some of them don't seem to work. And hopefully we can get some answers that will not only add more models to the overall narrative, but they can give us more ideas about how these people were using the sea and perhaps set up more future work. Okay. Well, that is a great segue into (laughs) where does, where does this all lead now? You've written this book talking about the application of this method. What are your next steps around this? I'd love to say I have a movie in the works, but I don't. (laughs) (laughs) It's gotta be a Netflix series or something. Come on. Yeah, I've been writing to people. No one's responding to my emails. (laughs) No, the the next steps, I think, were really prompted by the end of the previous project in which I started to realize that by modeling the activity of this maritime community, I think I'm Mm -hmm. also modeling their behavior. I'm modeling Mm -hmm. how they're using this space, the areas that they value, the areas that they're avoiding. And so for me, the next step with my research is to look at other ways of trying to model the behavior, the interests of this maritime community. So, you know, how else can I pull information of this archaeological data set? Are there new interpretive frameworks that I can apply to find new ways of thinking about this maritime community? Because, you know, they don't have really any written record. They they just don't. There's nothing there. But we've got this Mm. huge archaeological data set. So like any other community that we would classify as prehistoric, we can still come up with all kinds of information about that group. So can we do it to this group as well? And what can we learn? Awesome. Paul, any final thoughts on that? Uh, I have too many thoughts. Um, (laughs) Let's wrap it up before I I go down a rabbit hole myself. (laughs) Right, right. All right. Well, take a look at the show notes. We have the link to the past episode that we did, episode 126 in April of 2020. And we also have a link to the book, Reconstructing the Maritime Past. And that is available from Rutledge, aka Taylor and Francis. And you can, again, check that out. So, Matthew, this has been awesome. I really look forward to see what you do next in this space, uh, especially if you get a chance to apply this to other regions or if somebody does, that would be really great if they take your model and, you know, apply it to other maritime heavy locations, right? That would be really cool just to see how that works out. Any final things you'd like to say about this book or, or the or the topic at all before we end the show? No, no, you guys have been great. And Paul, Chris, it's always great to talk with you guys again. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. And we will see everybody else next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the Architect Podcast. Links to items mentioned on the show are in the show notes at www.archpodnet.com slash architect. 
Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com and paul at lugal.com. Support the show by becoming a member at arcpodnet.com slash members. The music is a song called Off Road and is licensed free from Apple. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.